Welcome everyone to Mushrooms and Yin Yoga. We have my dear friend Josh Summers with us, joining him from Maine. Uh, luckily has power now, which is great. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Storm blowing through. This will be about an hour. So we might we might go over and just request that everyone stay on mute. And um, yeah, if you know if you have a yoga mat, that'd be great. Blanket helps as well, but if you just have a fuzzy carpet or rug. I'm sure that would that would do just fine. Josh, do you want to give an intro on yourself? Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Alex. Good to see you. Um, so, an intro on me is I have for like about 20 years now been teaching Yin Yoga and and meditation um, in conjunction with with having a practice in acupuncture in Boston, where I had lived for a long time. Um, and I really got into the practice of yin yoga while I was studying acupuncture at the New England School of Acupuncture. And um, one of the things that attracted me about yin, yin yoga was that it, one of the things that attracted me about yin yoga was that it, at least theoretically, it influenced the chi through the channels of the body, or the, the main pathways of energetic conductance similar to the way that acupuncture would. Um, and while I was in school, I definitely could feel that. And, and one of the other primary benefits of the practice, at least for me at the time, was that it prepared the body to sit more comfortably in longer um, meditation practices. And I had been getting into doing silent meditation retreats um, around then and um, found that the, the yin practice was really, really balancing and, and opening of the body to, to support a comfortable, easeful, experience of meditation practice. So that's sort of how I got into it. And, um, and what I want to try to share with you tonight is just a way, sort of a simple introduction to the, to the practice and um, suggest ways that this practice can, can work like an energetic inner work, um, similar to Qigong or Tai Chi, to cultivate one's energy, to preserve one's energy, circulate one's energy in service of harmonization of Qi. And I'll, I'll be sort of speaking to that when we get into it. But as Alex said, this practice is really low key. Um, it's, it's very accessible. You don't need much. Um, a, a carpet is what I usually practice on myself for the set. I'll have a, a blanket on a sticky mat. Sometimes you can use props, but I'm gonna teach a propless class tonight. So you don't need anything beyond a, a good blanket or a carpet. Um, you can do yin yoga in your pajamas, which is the way I normally do it. I'll be not there tonight, but that's how you could. So um, just really, settle into it and, and relax. Um, and I will move to the, to the space. Um, unless there's anything else you want to add, Alex. I'm excited for this. I, um, I'm going to go take some, uh, of our calm tincture blend. So if anyone has some, this might be a good time to take a few squeezes to ease into that, that nice space. Yeah, and I just in full transparency, I took some reishi tincture that was offered to me from Alex um, and that I've been using. And uh, so that would go well too. I think that's part of your calm formula, right? Yeah, it's, it's mostly reishi, which is uh, such a good companion for, you know, keeping by your bedside table or just winding down at the end of the night on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> during a yin practice but uh, yeah hope everyone enjoys so so just on that theme i would say the maybe one of the intentions of the practice energetically is to function like reishi mushroom that it, reishi has a, a spirit calming effect um, and chinese medicine is used to settle the spirit so that uh, the spirit is at home in the heart and when that um, when that condition is met when the spirit is, is really grounded and, and anchored in the heart um, there's a kind of a wise relationship to context. Um, and one of the ways that that uh, manifests is that at night, when, which is the time to sleep, the context of night is to rest and sleep, your spirit is able to sleep and you can rest well and get, get good rest. Um, if it's agitated, if the spirit's agitated, that can lead to insomnia problems. So uh, the yin practice will have a similar energetic uh, intention. So I'm gonna move to the mat and just put my chair away. 
So if you want to join me on the floor and just make sure the angle I have here is uh, adequate so you can see what's happening. Um, I'm going to bring you into a, a pose straight away. Um, so sitting on the floor, and, and I'll say that as we practice, I will explain how and why as we go. So the first part is just how. And uh, like other forms of physical yoga, yin yoga will bring you into a physical posture. Um, and the first pose we'll do is one where you bring your, the soles of your feet together. You've probably done this before. You let your knees fall to the sides. And in this practice, you can allow there to be a little bit more space between your heels and hips to assist your ability to fold forward. If you were to draw the, the heels in quite closely, you might have more challenge coming into a forward fold. So the idea is with the feet forward, you'll be able to enter into a forward fold more. And in doing that, uh, you'll be able to stimulate the tissue or the connective tissue of your inner thighs, potentially the outer hips and along the spine. If you don't feel all of those areas, that's fine. If you, I usually say for beginners, as long as you feel it in one of the main areas that I described. So the inner groins, the outer thighs, or along the spine for this pose. So the, um, <clears throat> once you put the body into more or less this configuration, the idea is to come forward a bit and stop at your first edge of resistance. And um, I'm gonna say a little bit about that right now, which is <clears throat> a lot of times in, in physical yoga, at least this is what I remember from when I would take classes regularly. Um, and often if you go to a yoga class, there's, there's a, a a subtle or not so subtle psychological striving in your mind or in the room where people are trying to kind of contort themselves into idealized expressions of the posture, like maybe getting your head to the feet or your your chest to the feet or something like that. Um, and that is the exactly the wrong way to approach yoga in general, but especially it's the wrong way to approach this type of practice. So in this practice of yin, which I'll explain a little bit more about shortly, uh, less is really more. So coming into your first edge of resistance where you feel a mild tension or squeezing or pulling on the tissue and just pausing there. And the idea in yin yoga is that once we place a mild stress on certain parts of the body and the connective tissues within those, those areas of the body, once we place a mild stress there, we relax the muscles in those areas and then allow the body to be relatively still for several minutes so that they, the, the tissues literally um, kind of marinate or soak within the gentle stresses of the shape. That's the, the basics of the practice in a nutshell. And I'll, I'll say more about each of those themes, but the, the, just to review, we, we're coming into a shape where we place a mild stress on one or several regions of the body. And, every, and I'll call those out within the poses. So in this particular pose known as butterfly, the inner thighs, the outer hips, and the tissue along the back of your spine, it are these are the primary target areas. And um, you wanna come to an edge where you feel mild sensation uh, and allowing, at the, at the edge of mild sensation, allow the muscles to relax in these regions. And it's the, the relaxation of the muscles, the calming down, the quieting of the muscles, that allows the emphasis of the posture to be received by the, um, by the fascia. And I'm gonna speak more about what fascia is shortly too, but the fascia or connective tissue is what we're aiming to stimulate. And uh, when we relax the muscles and hang out for several minutes, this tissue starts to receive the stress and will start to slowly adapt to the stresses we're placing on it. And you might feel that there's a release and in certain parts of the body, which allows you to go forward a little bit more. Um, you may feel that you just get into a kind of a dull, achy experience. And I'll speak about that too, um, but that's normal. So if you feel a dull achiness in the body, particularly in the areas that you're stimulating, once we've been there for several minutes, that's very normal. Um, but the real magic, I should say, the real the proof in the pudding, the, re the, reason out, the reason why you're going to do it, the rationale behind why you do it is likely going to be noticeable after we come out of the pose. And, um, and I'll try to speak to why that is uh, in a little bit. But I've been speaking quite a bit 
already. And I want to give you just a, a minute or so of quiet in the pose, just to bring your awareness within, sense the felt sense of the, the, the pattern of sensation that the pose engenders, and let yourself just relax receptively within the experience. Okay, and now from wherever you are in this pose, you can press your palms down below your shoulders to assist your spine to lift up as you sit upright. And we'll just pause. You can straighten the legs forward for a moment and just rest. I'll be speaking about the breath in a few poses down the road. Um, but until we get there, just let your breath be natural and relaxed. Um, but right now, before we go into the next pose, what, what I want to introduce and mention is that in this style of practice, you'll notice that I'm not going to give everybody very, very precise cues around just exactly how to place your body. In other words, I'm not going to be giving very precise alignment cues. And the reason for that is not so much that alignment isn't important. It just so happens that historically, the man who re-energize this style of practice also was very, very knowledgeable about anatomy. And he brought to the yoga community's attention that everybody's bones are different, that everybody's the shape of your pelvis, the orientation of your hip sockets, the, the angle of the, uh, your femurs and the torsion in, the t in, your, in your thigh bones, every bone in your body is different a little bit from, or, not, or, or a lot between sides and also different from your body to the person uh, either uh, next to you, if you have anyone practicing next to you or to anybody else on this call. Everybody's skeletons are different. And because of that, it's impossible for a, t a, a teacher that's aware of this to give the same alignment cues for everybody. The one, one size fits all alignment just does not work um, in anything we do with our body. But especially when we have stay in poses for a long time, you'll really start to feel how uniquely, um, how unique your skeleton is and how that influences your ability. Now, the, the implications of all that are beyond what I can cover tonight. But I just want you to know that's the reason why I won't be giving super, super precise cues in alignment. I give suggestions. So the next suggestion is if you bring the, the, the heels of your feet together again, uh, take your let right foot out a little bit. And then I want you to e lean over to your right hip and internally rotate your left leg and place your foot to the side of your hip, your left foot to the side of your hip and your knee down like this. The intention of the pose we're about to do is to target and send sensation into the outer right hip. So you're gonna be looking for sensation in your outer right glute somewhere. You don't want sensation in your right knee. That's, that's the sort of the rule of thumb with this type of, this family of poses where the, the knee is bent and the thigh is externally rotating. You want zero sensation in your right knee. We're looking for the sensation in the, in the, in the right hip. Now we can play with what we do with the left leg to, to, to aid and abet getting sensation into the right hip. So I like to take my leg back a little bit, shoot my foot back a little bit. And then you can also play with where your front, uh, your right leg is. Do you bring the foot in? towards your pelvis? Do you bring the foot forward and out? Do you bring the knee out to the right? Do you bring the knee for, forward and over to the left? All of those things can be played with in service of sending sensation into your right hip. Now, <clears throat> you may know this pose as pigeon where the hips, the teacher might say, square the hips forward or have your hips level to the ground. I'm intentionally keeping or starting you with your right hip down on the ground so that you can, um, come into the pose with, with minimal sensation in your uh, right forward knee. So you can lean forward towards your right foot or towards the, the middle of the right shin or over the right knee. But as you bring the torso down, 
as you bring the torso close to the floor, this will likely send a little bit more weight into the pelvis, which will allow you to sense the stress or the stretch in the outer right hip. So uh, in yin yoga, we, we lightly rename the poses just to indicate that you hold the pose, you occupy the pose, you in inhabit the pose with muscles relaxed for longer periods of time. That's, that's the only reason you'll hear me use slightly different names for the poses. So we call, in, in the yin community, we call this pose swan. And with a hip down, sort of resting on the floor, I, I refer to this as collapsed swan. So the, the pelvis is sort of collapsed to the side, which, and I know, I just recognize this in some systems of yoga that this looks like kind of something that a heretic would do, <laughs> letting the hip come down like this. But I assure you, it's, um, it's as long as you're feeling it in the hip and nothing in your knee, this is functionally a beautiful and a very helpful way to do the pose. <clears throat> so the while you're here, make sure the time is running, the time is on. While you're here, the um, in addition to understanding kind of the basic mechanics of yin yoga, which are Again, that we come to a pose where we feel mild sensation. The sensation you want to feel in, this, in, this, in, the, in the targeted region, in this case, the right hip, should be somewhere around a two to four out of 10, meaning it's, it's mild, it's moderate, it's not aggressive, it's not overwhelming, it doesn't burn or stab. Um, but it may not be, particularly once you've been in the pose for three to four minutes, that sensation may not be your favorite cup of tea. It may have a, a slightly bitter, slightly dull, achy quality to it. That is normal. I want to normalize that sensation in the practice. That's actually to be encouraged. And I'll, again, I'll be, be speaking to why. Um, but from that edge, when we relax the muscles and stay relatively still, and I say relatively because you should know that if you need to during the hold at any point, you can back off from the pose or come out entirely. You can come out and just ro roll on your back. Um, but also sometimes when, the, when the, the tissue starts to release, you might find that you can go a little further. So there's this concept of playing the edge where if the sensation diminishes, you can go maybe, you can seek out and explore going a bit further. And if the sensation simmers above the appropriate tolerable range of mild, moderate sensation, it gets into the aggressive, painful, this is hurting me, I might not ever walk again vibe. If you start to feel that, you've got to back off. You've got to come out and rest. <clears throat> so from there, the approach to alignment um, is referred to as, that I've been sharing here, is, is called the functional approach to alignment. And in the functional approach, it's quite simple. We, we begin not by asking what the pose should look like, but we start with what the intention of the pose is. What's the rationale? Why are we doing the pose? And on a physical level, we're, we're occupying the pose to stimulate certain parts of the body to improve the quality of the tissue within that area. I'll speak about that shortly, or to improve the flow of energy through that area from an energetic perspective. So once we understand that we're, we're using the body as a way to stimulate certain areas of it, to optimize the health and, and flow of energy through it, um, then we can sort of break out, break out of the mold of thinking, oh, the correct way of doing the pose is defined by how accurate the pose looks. As I try to say in many of my trainings, the, the least accurate indicator of whether the pose is being done well is what the pose looks like. The most important indicator is what are you feeling? What is the practitioner? What are you right now feeling when you're in the pose? <clears throat> so in all the poses we'll be doing, I try, I'll be trying to identify what, you're, what and where you're trying to feel things. And then I'll be trying to give you some options for how you might configure your body to meet the intention. So from knowing the intention, I'll give you some actions to take. Those are things to do with your body. Once you uh, act upon those uh, actions, 
what you need to do is evaluate. You need to evaluate, is my experience in alignment with the stated intention? So in this case, in this pose, is your experience generating or are you experiencing mild, moderate sensation of gentle stretch in the outer right glute? And if so, you rejoice, you hang out, you abide in that. And if not, then you need to sort of play around with your alignment. Move your foot, your, your shin, your knee, your hips, your back. Play with things to, to try to find a, a more optimal form or shape for yourself. Okay, so you've been in the pose now for just, over, just about five minutes, which is roughly the normal time frame for a yin yoga pose. Now you can roll onto your right hip and take the first uh, pose that I refer to as resonance pose. If you lie on your back or come into a neutral position and just feel the resonant response in your body to the previous posture. And I'll be quiet for a bit while you reflect on what you're noticing. Let the, let the breath be calm, relaxed, comfortable. Do you recommend breathing through your nose? With your mouth closed. And just feel what you feel from side to side. Having I mean, stimulated the right side to the outer right hip. What is the quality, the tone, texture of the sensation there versus the quality, tone, texture of the sensation on the left leg? Now, your own practice, you can, you know, map out or decide how long you want to rest. Um, sometimes I rest for a minute or two. Sometimes I rest as much as up to five minutes, and occasionally I might even fall asleep in the residence pose. But tonight I'm going to I'm going to keep them a little bit shorter, just to in service of bringing some more poses to the practice. Um, so go ahead and bring your knees into your chest now. Hugging your knees, you can rock up to a seated position. And I'm going to face you again from sitting, take your feet wide, and now let your knees fall to the left. So your left leg is now externally rotating, your right leg is internally rotating. And now we're going to try to send the sensation into the outer left hip, outer left glute. So the first thing I might do is open the space between my legs a little bit more, taking my right leg back. And then I'm going to bring my left foot forward some, Bring my left knee out a little bit more, but still keeping my, my left hip down. And then I'm gonna lean over towards my left foot, sort of between my foot and shin. But again, you can play with the angle of where you lean. If you lean more towards the knee, the shin, or the foot, do you uh, come up on like onto the shin more and, and square your hips forward? That's another option. Um, do you bring the foot? In the back knee, in this case, the right knee close in, or do you send the leg far back? All those variables you can play with. But the main thing you're looking for is sensation in the outer left hip, outer left glute, and no sensation, in this case, no sensation in your forward knee, or your left knee. as you settle yourself into the second side of swan pose. Um, first off, I'm gonna say a few things, but from here on out, I just want you to know that the, the things I'll be saying are, are sort of there for your 
edification to try to give you some reasoning for why you might want to consider integrating uh, a form of this uh, practice into your, your routine already. And I mean that in the sense that if you have another yoga practice, this, this style of yin yoga complements many other forms of active yoga. Um, all forms of physical yoga will influence the fascia, but the yin style has a kind of a particular way of influencing it, just like the yang or active styles of yoga have a particular way of influencing the fascia. And some of the stuff that we're learning from the, the research being done on fascia, or the, I should spell out what is fascia for those of you that don't know. Um, fascia, broadly speaking, um, could be thought of as the soft skeleton of the body. It's a three-dimensional tissue webbing that literally invests and envelops and wraps around every cell in your body. So uh, one of the fascial experts from my neck of the woods, Tom Meyer says, the fascia is the environment that your cells live in. And it's primarily composed of fibers, particularly collagen, and uh, kind of a mucus-like gel uh, that has a lot of water in it. And um, depending on where the fascia is, it will have different ratios of those components. Sometimes there's a lot, 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 many more fibers in the, in the fascia. Sometimes there's a lot more gels in the fascia. But the, um, the fascia is this body-wide membrane or a metamembrane. And uh, some of the research on stretching that's, that's looked at stretches similar to what we're doing in yin yoga has shown that the long held passive stretch, just like we're doing right now, the long held passive stretches, um, at least in animal studies have been shown to reduce inflammation in the fascia, as well as reducing fibrosis or uh, excessive um, presence of, of too many fibers that kind of create a, a felt like mat in the, in the fascia that becomes uh, Kind of difficult to hold water and difficult for components like nutrients from the blood, gas from the blood, waste products from the cells. It becomes a difficult medium for the, 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 the transference and diffusion of, of things through the fascia when the, when the fascia is very fibrotic. So inflammation, systemic inflammation and fibrosis are two, two things that aren't such good markers for, for good health. Um, so anything that brings those down is going to be uh, a very good thing for your overall health. And the woman, uh, the researcher who conducted these studies also looked at um, how decreasing inflammation and de decreasing fibrosis uh, in impacted the, the growth and spread of breast cancer tissue in in mice. And um, with no other intervention, a group of stretched mice that, that were given breast cancer had 52% reduced, or 52% less cancer, I should say, than the, than the unstretched mice in this particular study. Um, and that's pretty remarkable. And, and so her takeaway was that in oncology, we often, research is often geared towards what's going wrong in the cells but no one's been really asking questions about what's going wrong in the environment and the environment would be the fascia. So this is not to say yin yoga is going to cure cancer. I'm certainly not trying to say that. I'm just trying to suggest that what she, this particular researcher, Helen Langevin found was that with decreased inflammation, decreased fibrosis in the, in the fascia, there was a reduction of physical pain, um, but also there was sort of this uh, improved Im immunological function of the environment of the fascia itself. Okay, so from here, you can now lean over onto your left hip a little bit and send your left leg down by your right. And again, come onto your back. And just let be, let go. <clears throat> There's also been some studies that suggests that the long held stretches are a way of in some ways cleaning out the sponge like matrix of the fascia. So uh, 
many, many folks in the fascia world refer to the fascia as a body wide sponge. It's this three dimensional webbing slash sponge that is connected and interconnected with everything. And when we hold these poses, the long held stretches, it squeezes the sort of the dreck of the tissue. It's like squeezing the sponge, it squeezes the inflammatory molecules. And, it squeezes metabolic waste out of the tissue and it squeezes a lot of water out of the tissue. But what one researcher found was that when the stretch was released and all that direct was squeezed out, the, uh, in, the, in the sort of the following time after the stretch, the, the tissue reabsorbed more water than it held prior to the stretch and became kind of um, more hydrated as a response to the stretch. So this is, this is great for uh, the diffusion of nutrients from the capillaries to the cells in this area, um, but it's also systemically good just for, uh, for biomechanical properties of the tissue to be well hydrated and more, more resistant to, to injury or tear. But within the rest, and now once again, feeling the tone of your left leg to your right leg, what I'm interested in is helping you or having you explore what the, the, the immediate impact from a felt sense perspective is within your body. I don't intentionally not trying to give you too many words to describe the sensation because I want you to encounter your own experience unmediated by concepts or language that I might give for what you might try to feel. Okay, and then from the rest here, you can bend the knees a little bit and roll onto your right side and then roll onto your stomach. And coming onto your stomach, we're going to take the spine in, a, in the opposite direction from the way we've been going so far. So far, we've been more or less taking the spine into a forward fold configuration or a flex, flexed position. Now we're going to extend or bring the spine to a bit of a back bend. And to do that, you'll bring your elbows to start potentially underneath your shoulders. So I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna ask you to start there, bringing the elbows under your shoulders, just enough so that your upper arm bones support your chest, allowing target area, in this case, your lower back to relax. So we're, we're, we're specifically intending to send mild degree of sensation into the lumbar, into the lower back, gently squeezing the bones together here a bit. Um, but the key thing there is it needs to be mild compression. Um, so if you feel aggressive sensation um, at this range of motion with your elbows under your shoulders, you may want to walk your elbows forward a bit, maybe cross your hands to the opposite side of uh, to the outside of the elbow and even let your head rest down. And that is a way to decrease the spinal extension and um, come to a milder edge if that's a necessary or appropriate for you. But for many folks, um, the elbows under the shoulders is a, is a pretty good starting place. And the palms can just be together, put face down. Um, and as I said, you know, this is a pose of extension or extending the spine. And, and so the quality of sensation you'll feel in your lower back will be a different type of sensation. The other poses we've been doing have been tensile, where they're creating tension or pulling tissue from, uh, you know, pulling tension into a, more of a longer configuration or stretching it, you think of a stretch. In this pose, you may be feeling some stretch across the front of your abdomen, but more likely you'll be feeling a, a mild compression or squeezing sensation in your lumbar. And that, uh, again, in other systems of yoga, that condition of gently squeezing the lumbar and compression is discouraged. You're often told, don't hang in your lower back. Don't, 
Don't sink into your lower back, engage, lift, lengthen, do all sorts of things to avoid that. Um, and those cues are fine in active context where you're maybe trying to strengthen the muscles and distribute the stress more evenly to the spine. But what we're doing here is explicitly, directly trying to stress those tissues. Like, and, and stress here is, is used, when I use that term, I use it in the sense of exercise. Where, where in the exercise tissue, we ask a bit more of it and then we rest it. So to stress the lumbar, particularly the joint, the, 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 the discs of the, of the lower spine, the connective tissues around the joint and the bones themselves, we allow and encourage a gentle compression here. <clears throat> now, this is a good place to begin to kind of switch gears and talk a little bit more about the energetic theory at play in the practice. So in Chinese medicine, as you may know, there's this concept of qi and qi is different forms and sort of it's a spectrum of different manifestations of qi. Everything um, in one level in the universe is composed of some condensation or aggregation of, of, this, of this qi, independent of whether it has life force or not. So life force is not always the, the best definition of qi. In many ways, qi resists translation in English. We don't have a good concept of word in English. But from this universal qi, there is a animating life force of qi that, that circulates in our body and gives us our life. Um, and the Taoists felt that kind of the, the evolution of a human spirit is to take in the universal chi, convert this universal chi into energy breath, uh, sort of circulating life force in the body. And then in, in refining this energy breath chi, this life force, we transform and, and refine that energy further into what they refer to as divine chi. And divine chi has the ability to, to, to shape things, to change conditions in the world, to bring creativity into the world, to, to influence your own health, to influence your relationships for the better. <clears throat> and so this is part of what I think is happening within the yin yoga process. Um, essentially, one way to look at what we do in yin yoga for, with, with regards to our energy is that we are enhancing its circulation and strength. And one of the main patterns of qi disharmony is qi stagnation, where the qi, there's something that's blocking the free flow of this energy. And one of the telltale symptoms of qi stagnation is pain or achiness um, or irritability even. And why that's relevant to what we're doing right now is that my guess is that since we've been here for about five minutes, you're probably starting to feel a dull achy sensation in your lower back, which is again, a normalized uh, encouraged sensation in this practice. And essentially what that is, is a form of mild temporary chi stagnation. That there's a kind of a damming or welling up of the energy that's getting blocked in the lower back through, due to the compressive force of the, of the posture. But the, the experiential reporting of many yin yoga practitioners you now for, for decades is that when the pose is released, that temporary stagnation that we, the pose engenders, that, that when the pose is released, that, that stagnation uh, itself dissipates or dissolves. And in, in its response, in, in, in its place, there's, a, there's often a very vibrant sense of subtle energy conductance or subtle energy shimmering. So, 
when we come down now, I'll ask you to look for what unfolds in the target area, in this case, the lower back. So as we slowly take the elbows to the sides and let your head rest the back of your hands, There might be a, a tremendous sense of release or relief, I should say, great relief. Oh, thank goodness, that's over. <laughs> but wait for it now as you relax and just feel your, your belly moving gently against the floor as you breathe. Track the sensations in your lumbar. It usually takes somewhere between 30 seconds to a minute after releasing a yin style pose before the, the bitterness of the pose subsides and a, and a kind of sweetness of experience emerges. Okay, good. And then from lying on your stomach, place your palms by your shoulders to push yourself back into a child's pose. Now, I want you to do child's pose today with the explicit intention of trying to uh, release or decompress your lumbar. So for me, that's best achieved when I keep my knees together. For other people, they get the, the release in their lumbar and their low, lower back better when they take their knees wide. So there's no one size fits all here. Um, you might try bringing your knees together and seeing what that's like. You're looking for a mild stretch through the lumbar here. And this is in some ways a counter pose to the gentle compressive pose we were just in. <clears throat> So on the theme of helping to um, improve the circulation of our vital energy, one of the things that the, the ancient Chinese became aware of was that the way they described it was that bad energy, or pathogenic energy, the, the, the five primary evil energies of Chinese medicine, which include heat and dampness and cold and wind and dryness. But often cold and damp or heat and damp, these, these bad energies tend to accumulate at the sites of our joints, in and around our joints. And if you think about it, the joints in, in our body are kind of like morphological sites of transition where the body is changing from one direction to another and able to move through that, that change. Um, they're a little bit like intersections in, in say, you know, a grid of, of, of roadways. And what often, can often happen at these intersection sites is that there can be accumulation of traffic or uh, a backup of, of, of flow of traffic. And it's somewhat similar in, in, in terms of the joints and our body's energetic flow. The Chinese have felt that if there was an accumulation of bad qi, of usually damp with heat or cold, that that obstructs the flow through the joint, which can dysregulate or disrupt the flow of qi through the whole body. So, um, why this is relevant to yin yoga is because in addition to kind of giving a generalized stimulation to the fascia, one of the things that, that yin yoga seems to do is, is specifically place a kind of an exercise like stress, or I should say a tissue specific exercise like stress to the joints. I mean, the, 
tissue specific exercise for the joints. Because when we, when we come into poses and we, we're, we, we let the muscles relax, when the muscles are relaxed, the joints start to receive a little bit more of the stress. And that's why we wanna go mildly because if we go aggressively and we put too much stress into the joints that could potentially overstretch them or, or, or just um, injure them. So the joint tissues, this, this denser connective tissue, the denser fascia at the joints uh, is trained best under gentle loads for a long period of time. So a mild stress over a long period of time as opposed to a strong aggressive stress over a short period of time. So when we occupy poses, we stay for say several minutes with the muscles relaxed. This allows the, the joint spaces themselves to be gently squeezed and gently pulled right, in traction and compression which in itself, particularly when we finish the practice, we can experience a, a, a greater flow of energy through the body and as, a, as a whole, because the joint spaces, in my, in my opinion, are, are, more, um, are less obstructed and more conductive of this chi flow. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have you sit up for a moment and I'll face you for this pose. Next one, we'll, I think we have time for a couple forward folds and a quick twist to, to round out. So uh, just as in terms of a sequence, what I've been trying to do with you is um, take you through a range of postures that target kind of the, some of the main regions of the body. We did a little bit for the inner legs, we did a little bit for the outer hips, we did a little bit for the lower back, both in extension and flexion. And now we're going to do the whole back body in a forward fold. So as you sit straight, take your left knee. I always have to reverse it here. It always throws me off a little bit. But bending your left knee, taking your left foot uh, to the outside of your right thigh. So your right leg will remain straight and your left knee bends and swings over the extended right leg. This will, you probably be very aware of sensations you lean forward in, in the back of your knee, the back of your calf, the back of your hamstrings and possibly along your spine. Those are all the target regions, the entire back body to the, back, to the entire right leg and the spine. And the idea is just to bring yourself to a mild edge. Again, this does not need to be maximal in any way, just a mild edge of moderate sensation and just rest. So you notice that even I'm, I'm intentionally doing this in some ways, but I'm not like pulling myself forward and, and, and tucking my head down. I'm just pausing about here. This is, as I try to joke sometimes, this range of motion confers no spiritual impressiveness. This is not spiritually impressive to just rest here. So I say that in the sense that we hopefully we can liberate ourselves from this idea that the deeper the pose, the better and more spiritual the, the practitioner is. That's, that's, that's spiritual materialism. Here, mild is the name of the game. And we're just tuning into what you're feeling while you're holding the pose. And you'll likely, uh, if I have described it well, you'll likely feel a not so pleasant, dull, moderate achiness through these main areas that you're stimulating. But the, I'd say that, and I say this gently, but the maturity of a yin practitioner is that they, I think they appreciate that, that where, what develops within the practice and where they, how they feel after, meaning they'll, they'll be willing to tolerate the slightly unpleasant achiness and and I should say too, that when the, when the chi is, is stagnant, uh, the chi flows with emotion. So when the chi is blocked a little bit or stagnant temporarily, the emotions can feel stagnant or blocked. And uh, a symptom of that is that there's a lot more edginess or irritability. So having taught this for a long, long time, I know people can get a little bit irritated in a pose, particularly if a teacher is given to speaking too much in a class, which I've done tonight. Uh, that can stir up a lot of irritability. 
uh, but track that during the pose and then track it when we rest after. <clears throat> so again, just keep the breath relaxed and calm through the nose. There's, there's other elements of the breath practice that we could, you can emphasize here, particularly keeping the inhalation a little lighter and the exhalation slow, smooth, slow, uh, deep. Um, it's that it's it's the extension, the gentle, natural extension of the exhalation that starts to optimize the, the biochemistry of the blood to deliver oxygen more efficiently throughout the body. Again, that's another whole whole topic, but keeping the breath relaxed for now and comfortable is is a good first step. And just allowing the breath to be subtler and subtler if it's inclined to do that. So one way of abiding, letting your mind rest within the experience is just to let your awareness be receptive to the whole pattern of your body. As you internalize your mind and feel the, what in Buddhism referred to as the body within the body, the immediate felt sense of the body. You can become a little bit more sensitive to how the body receives the energy breath or how the, the, the dynamic of breathing in, breathing out conditions, the dynamic of the pattern of physical sensation. Okay. Now from here, you can walk your hands back. We'll sit up a little bit uncross the left leg. And I'm gonna, we will have a resonance after the second side, but I'm gonna take you right into the, the second side first. So swing your right knee and right foot over the left leg, taking the right foot to the side of the left thigh. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, your knee doesn't, I should have said this on the first side, but your right knee in this case, doesn't need to stack right over your left. It could be a little bit out to the side. The idea is that with the, with the uh, right leg bent, knee bent, it will allow your pelvis to roll forward a little bit more to emphasize the back of the left leg and along the, left, on the, along the spine. So, um, and it, there's different versions of this pose. Sometimes it's more like a half butterfly where the foot comes to the inside of the thigh and sometimes you internally rotate the, the leg for half frog. Um, but for most people, this one is pretty accessible to swinging the, the knee over a bit. And again, coming to your first mild edge of resistance and just pausing. It's the gentle stress with the muscles relaxed over a long, several minutes span of time <clears throat> that allows this, this, this steady state of the fascia to slowly start to release and change. You can think of it like gently tugging on toffee pull off two ends of toffee too quickly, it will tear. If you gently apply a, a mild stress over a long time, it will slowly start to creep and lengthen. And that's somewhat analogous to what's going on here. The, the, uh, you don't have to worry about overstretching anything because we're staying within mild ranges of motion, which is why I've, I keep using the word st stress in the sense that we're taxing the tissue slightly to trigger and catalyze the mechanisms of physiological repair and remodeling. And it's the stress that gives the, the cells of the connective tissue the good instructions to, to repair and remodel the tissue uh, for optimal or better health. But once you get a, hang, a handle of the practice, um, the practice itself becomes extremely meditative. And 
you don't need someone like me talking the whole time, kind of encouraging you why you might want to do the practice. Um, once you have a feel for it, you can practice and, like I said, in a lot of circumstances on the, on the floor, or rug, or mat, um, and you don't have to have a whole hour. You could just do a few poses, um, but it's a great way to release deep tension in the connective tissue and help, uh, we'll see how you feel, but help, help harmonize and circulate your energy better. Soft inhalations, quiet, slow exhalations. Sensitive to how the, the breath interacts with the sensations in your body. And from here, you can walk your hands again under your shoulders. Just sit up gently and cross your right leg. And now you get the dessert of lying coming on your back again. So just ease yourself gently. You Something I didn't mention, which is worth mentioning, because it's one of those things that can scare people a lot. But as you lie back, what I want to mention is that um, just as it's normal to feel a dull, achy sensation in a pose, that, that's the sort of the, the qualitative sen sensation that tends to occur when people gently hold these poses for a while. That's how the fascia feels when we stress it for several minutes. Um, just as that's normal and to be encouraged, another normal feature of this practice, which can seem alarming at first, is when you come out of the pose. So when, well, upon exiting, you may feel, as my Irish friends would say, that you feel you become ancient. You feel like you've aged a decade uh, within the pose. And that is because that the area, it may feel sensitive, it may feel delicate, fragile, vulnerable. Um, there's many reasons that might explain that sensation, but in, to put it simply, it's it's the immediate aftermath of exercising the tissue. You're all, you're all familiar with what um, it's like to have delayed onset muscle soreness when you've worked out, gone for a long hike, and the next day or two days later, you're suddenly extremely sore and stiff because of the um, recovery of the exercise. And similarly, uh, in yin yoga, the, you don't get a delayed response. You get more of an instantaneous tissue soreness that doesn't really last much more than a minute or two. So coming out of the poses, if you've been feeling at all concerned about feeling like you're creaky, uh, you're ancient, disinclined to move, uh, rapid onset aging, whatever it feels like, don't be alarmed. Uh, that is part of part and parcel of the practice um, it will usually dissipate within a minute or so which is why one of the reasons why we do this relaxing resonance after the end poses
and then from residents we'll, we'll finish our practice with a twist and so this is somewhat intentional that I think it's always a good idea to, to articulate or move the spine through its some of its primary movement patterns we've done flexion and extension now and now we're going to add some rotational twist or torsion so bending your knees standing your feet to the floor just take your hips a little bit over to the left and then draw your knees together in towards your chest a little bit and roll onto your right side like you're going to sleep on your right so i'm on my left shoulders over my right shoulder my knees are together and stacked and this is just a generalized starting place um, where exactly you place your knees you, and there are other modifications that you can get into but we'll keep it really simple for now the idea will be from lying on your right you're going to open your upper chest and left shoulder over to the left a little bit but keep your left hand for a moment or two on your left waist this just allows the spine to gradually start to adapt and twist in a non-aggressive way. I just I realize I'll be going over a few minutes just to get these twists in and the final rest. So I'll shave a few. You can hold the twist for five minutes like the other poses, but I'll shave a few minutes off just to be a little bit more economical on time. But the idea is that by entering from the upper body, not, not moving to twist from the lower body, you, you'll be distributing the twist a little bit more through the full spine, not so much concentrating in the lumbar. And you'll be entering into the pose more slowly, which allows you to really assess the appropriate edge. So once you've been here for a bit, you know, your tissues start to adapt, you might find taking the right arm out enhances the, the twisting dynamic of the pose. So you might take your right arm further out, or sorry, your left arm further out, overhead or to the side. So the target area in this pose is the lumbar and, and lower abdomen primarily. We're just affecting a mild twist to the tissue or squeezing the sponge through a twist. And then to exit the pose, what I recommend is to retrace the way you came in, which is to roll back over onto your right side like you're going to sleep on your right for a moment. So in exiting the twist, again, you might feel that temporary, immediate, so just mild vulnerability or fragility in the lumbar. I just want to give that a half a minute or so to normalize. And then we'll take the second side. You just ease over to your back. Lying on your back, you can shift your hips a little bit to the right. Bring your knees in and roll over onto your left side, like you're going to sleep on your left. And then uh, keeping your right hand on your waist, you just going to yawn the upper chest and the right shoulder over to the right to some degree where, where you start to feel mild tension and torsion through the abdomen.
So if you felt you needed a little bit more of the twist, this is where you might consider taking the right arm further out to the side, extending the elbow. And one of the interesting things about this practice I find is that in the slowness of it, you, you can really feel sensitively to the effects of different actions of your body, different placement of your limbs, different alignment considerations. You really feel how the, the, the vector of sensation or the line of stress changes with small small adjustments to the body. They're, they're much more vivid in the simplistic slowness and steadiness of the pose. So when you take your arm out, what is that effect on the, the abdomen? You can also raise the same question if you turn your head to the right or turn your head to the left, what is the head orientation's effect on the targeted experience in the abdomen. So just coming back to the alignment theme for a moment, it's not so much that I'm here to say, do this, don't do that, do this, definitely don't do that. It's more try this, try that, which for you brings about the desired effect in the body that we're intending for. In this case, mild tension and torsion in the, in the, in the abdomen and lumbar spine. Okay, I know those twists were a little bit shorter, but it's often the case with me that I find the, sometimes in, in lead classes, the twists get a little bit squeezed due to time constraints, but you can practice these in your own practice going forward. Bring your right hand back in and roll over onto your left side. Pause again on the left. And then when you feel ready, you can ease onto your back and just lie comfortably however you'd like on your back. If you need a blanket over you or something a little bit cushion under your knees or even a little bit of a lift of something under your head, you can do that. Your arms can be at your side or uh, I like to, lately I've been doing uh, this position where my, le my left hand rests on my, uh, lower abdomen, just encouraging the breath to move from the belly. And my other right hand rests on the heart. However you feel comfortable, let's lie back and really feel now the, the resonant effects of the, the overall sequence in your body and mind. So while resting, uh, one of the things that I started to notice about how yin yoga affected me personally um, was that after the practice, my mind felt 
what I would or to describe it, I would say my mind feels, my consciousness feels effortlessly embodied. Like it, coming from a, a mindfulness perspective, sometimes we kind of prompt ourselves with meditative cues, be present to your body, notice the sensations in your body. But uh, within the yin practice, or after the yin practices, I found that there was really this, this effortless embodiment and what accompanied that embodied feeling was a, a real uh, sweet, pleasurable sense of calm. There was just a contented okayness, independent of whatever else might be going on. But within my mind and body, things were okay, calm, awake, and present. And now we'll just slowly transition to come up. Again, I, uh, in, a, in a regular class or a regular practice, I would encourage you to stay in the rest pose for maybe 10, even 15 minutes and really just let yourself luxuriate in that. But I wanna be mindful and respectful of your time commitments tonight. Um, so you can bend your knees one at a time and then roll to your side to bring yourself up to a seated position. And I'm going to meet you back at the monitor, or meet Alex back at the monitor, I think. There he is. Alex, your room is looking very yin. You definitely helped a lot. And yeah. my, our puppy in the beginning was running around, and now she's asleep in the corner. So. Thank you. I'm sure <laughs> See, say thank you as well. Your your divine chi had an effect on the dog. This is a divine chi can change change things around it. That's good. Um, that was much needed. Um, I'm sure if uh, I'm not the only one who feels feels that way. It's in this busy world. It's it's a real treat when we could take time to return back to the body and here and now. It's easy to be a floating head. <laughs> and it's a treat when we can come back to the body. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. For everyone here, if you need to go about your, your night, feel free to drop off. If you have about five, five or so minutes, be great if, uh, you can continue being with us. I, I would love to comment on, on something that I really appreciated from Josh's point of view and, and the way he teaches is in this extreme world in which we're in, uh, it's easy to get into a trip of judgment, whether it's having the right yoga clothes or looking a certain way, or as Josh was pointing out, doing a pose in the right way, right? And being hard on yourself for not fitting that role or, or being in that projection of what you think is right. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, but my mind wandered quite a few times during this hour and of what am I, what am I going to make for dinner or, um, you know, wow, I've been holding on to a lot of stress and, and it's easy to get hard on yourself. Maybe you realize that your mind is wandering and, and it's like, Oh, I have to be present now. I have to come back. And, you know, it, Something that I, I want everyone to, to kind of leave with is a good quote that one of my teachers has uh, taught me was, it's better to eat a bowl of ice cream with love than eat a hundred bowls of kale with hate. <laughs> and, you know, we could do all the poses, we could 
take all the supplements, we could do all the things, but, you know, if we're judging ourselves and if, you know, um, we're, we're trying so hard to fit into a box, I think we're missing the point. And, you know, some people think meditation is sitting on a cushion and, you know, having mala beads and looking like the type of the spiritual enlightened being. But for some people, meditation could be cracking a beer, plopping on the couch and having one moment to yourself where you can breathe. And if that's you, that's perfectly acceptable. And that is so good, right? And there's no one right way to do things. And I, I really appreciate it, Josh, you gave that perspective of, you know, whatever works for you, right? And when you leave here, if yin yoga was, is not the practice for you, find what works for you. If, if mushrooms are not for you, find what works for you and don't feel the pressure to, to, to fit into a role. Find what works for you and meet yourself where you're at. That and I am. Um, I've got a question. I've got a comment. If it's okay before we sign off, I want to thank you. I thought this was really wonderful. Um, it was totally what I didn't expect, and I'm. It goes back to the thing about judgment. When you said mushrooms, I was thinking magic mushrooms, and I was thinking this is going to be some, you know, psilocybin kind of trip. And I do yin yoga, and it was. Totally. It was so grounding. So the opposite. So exactly what I need. Like if it was, I thought, okay, they're going to do mushrooms. I'll just, you know, I'll just chill. I'll do the class, but I don't know what they're talking about with mushrooms. So I still don't know about the Marishi mushrooms, but I'm glad it wasn't psychedelic. And I was so grounded. And um, my question, so thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Um, what's the difference between yin and restorative yoga, or is, is it just linguistics? It's a great question. Um, uh, in general, my, the sense we have is that in restorative yoga, you might bring the body into a similar pose that looks similar to what we're doing in yin yoga, but the experience within the pose will be different. In restorative, you try to prop the body in a way that's very neutral. And that, that allows the nervous system to calm down in a, in a unique way um, and is very nourishing. In yin, we're looking for a little bit of stress though. We're looking for sensation to, to exercise the, the fascia in a, in a little bit, I hate to use the word aggressive, but it's a little bit more aggressive in the sense that we're placing a load on the tissue, whereas in, in restorative, you generally wouldn't. Um, and that's the, that's the main Main, okay. main that, that, that's interesting because I brought tons of pillows and blocks with me and my natural instinct for a lot of the poses was to to go into I guess more of a restorative thing but I've had two knee replacements so and a pose like child's pose for me is torture mm -hmm. so it's I, I really appreciate what you said about doing the right um like you know, I've been in so many yoga classes and they say, oh, relax, go into, you know, um, and there's the one where you sit on your heels. I've never, five years old, I couldn't sit on my heels. I'm now yeah. 68. Like, it's like, you know, I really respect you as a teacher to say that, that our bodies are all different. And, um, you know, I, like, yeah, it was really, really cool. Are you doing this again? Is this a regular or is this a one at one time thing? indetermined like, come on again <laughs> <laughs> like is this a regular class every tuesday night or was this just once uh, like a treat for us this was a treat that could be we could we could we could have a, a replay or a, a revisit of the treat I, I i have some teach i have classes regularly on on uh, online uh during the week i have a, I have a meditation on monday nights and a, a noontime yin class 90 minute yin class on wednesdays Oh. And if you're not able to come live, those can those we record them all, so you you could you could uh, get get the recording to to view the class with, if you wanted. Um, but Would you I, please put that in the chat? Like I, I don't know how I'd connect with you again. This is just sort of a an event bright fluke, I think, sort of. Yeah, yeah. I, if it's okay, Alex, will you be sending the emails of the registration registrants? Yeah. So. Anyone that registered, so you'll you'll receive an email, one email from from me and my partner Terry about 
you know, how, what we teach and, and how to find more about us if you're interested. Okay, and what city are you in? Where, where? I live in, I live north of Portland, Maine. Okay. Uh, so you're Eastern time. I'm in Toronto, so it's Eastern. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Eastern, yeah. Yay, okay, thank you. Good night and uh, blessings to you all. And you know, I I, I I just want to share your your slight anxiety about the mushroom and Indian yoga pairing. I, I saw the announcements myself. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't expecting that. And then I and I also had had a similar thought. Like it might look like we're going to be offering psilocybin and and yin, which I think could be quite interesting, but not something to do online. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah. Thank you again. My Thank pleasure. Yeah. And. This was recorded as well. And so we will send out an email with the recording and it will be on YouTube. So if you liked it and you want to experience this again and again, you can hit replay. Great. Yeah, Thank no, you was... so much, everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you, Alex. It's great to see you and, and thanks a lot. All the best, everybody. Take care. Take care, guys.